Steve, I appreciate you sitting down with us today. Not a problem, man. God bless you. You know, it's a Sunday. You're always working hard. I really respect that. Yeah, you know, you know it's no days off. It's 25-8, right. eight days a week, to be honest with you. Um, that's what is instilled in me, to work hard and have patience and sacrifice a lot, and then you'll be successful. For sure. Um, when did this journey start for you in the music industry? Well, this journey started over 30 years ago. Okay. I know I look 38, thank you. <laughs> but um, over 30 years ago, through a guy named Jam Master J, rest in peace, from Run DMC. All right, yeah. Hopefully everybody out there watching and listening knows who Run DMC is for their music and their legacy and what they did for the culture, you know, from Adidas to first artists to go platinum, so on and so forth. But Jam Master J and Run DMC put me in the music industry. I was able to be on Russell Simmons and Leo Cohen. And by being around them, I would listen and learn. You know, Russell Simmons is my mentor. And I feel everybody should have a mentor. Right. Having a mentor is very important. Um, and then when you first started off, what was the first couple of jobs that you had in the industry? Like, what was your role when you were working with Russell and Leo and things like well, that? Well, you know, I didn't really work for Russell and Leo. Like I said, I was around them. Around I worked them. with Run DMC and Jam Master J, and it was driving a van, right. going to do shows, carrying luggage, carrying records, going to meetings, whatever it needed to do. I did it. Right. Um, you know, shame to the game. That's how you learn, you educate. Because opportunities don't knock all the time. So when opportunities knock, you take advantage of them in a good way. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to work my way into work at Sony. And I got to work at Sony Records and um, got a job there. And they asked me if I knew how to do retail promotions. I didn't, but I said, yeah. And that job entitled going around all the record stores in New York City. From, I'm from Queens, but I'll go to Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Staten Island, uh, Manhattan, even Long Island. And you go to the independent record stores and you would go check on, you know, what's selling. Uh, putting up poster boards, giving out t-shirts, promo uh, samplers, so on and so forth. And from there, they were like, hey, do you know how to do radio promotions? I'm like, yeah, but I didn't. I learned it as I went. Then next thing you know, A&R. So Sony taught me a lot because that's what opened the door after Run DMC. Um, I got to work with a lot of artists from all over the country. Now, traveling Run DMC, you would go around the country. But when you're from New York, all you're really into is New York music. Right. And then you open your ears to things. So working in Relativity Sony, I was able to work with M.O.P., The Beat Nuts, Fat Joe, Frankie Cutlass. I was also able to work with Eazy, -E, MC Ren, Bone Thugs and Harmony, At Band Clan, which is Will I Am. At, you know, because Ruthless Records was distributed by Relativity. I also got to work with Suave House and Tony Draper, which was April on MJG and Mr. Mike and South Circle and Crime Boss from Houston. Um, I also got to work with the Dayton family out of the Midwest and Bone Thugs and Harmony out of the Midwest. I also got to work with Drew Down and Mac Mall out of the Bay Area. So my ears were opening to all different sounds and, you know, vocals from all over the country um, working at Relativity Sony. Gotcha. So you were able to work with a wide range of artists, and these artists were established, you know, top of the line artists as well. Yeah, you know, back in the days, you know, most artists would get signed to a record label for seven albums. Right. And they would be million dollar contracts. But the reason they were signed for seven albums, because the first go around is usually not when you make your success. It goes to two or three albums. Sometimes you do, like, you know, Bone Thugs and Harmony, their first album, East 99 Eternal, major release, was huge. Right. But, you know, they had big records off that. So, but it is, is that, you know, back then the, the, the video budgets were a lot of money. There was no iPhones. There was no social media. Um, there was no one running around with photographers. You know, you had to go and do a photo shoot for an album. Right. You know, it was real studio stuff with reels. So if you do a collab, you have to FedEx the reel and wait for weeks. If you sample the record, you take six months to get the sample cleared, so on and so forth. Right. And I see you've worked with a lot of artists. Some of them just on, like, coming up and some of them are really established what what is it in terms of the characteristics that really that you need in order to take it to that next level to become one of the greats well you know patience right sacrifice um it's really a marathon not a sprint you know rest in peace to nipsey you know for him saying that but it really is you know hard work really pays off and i was instrumental and in, instrumental instrumental with my partner Big U and putting Nipsey Hussle on. He was doing his thing locally in South Central, but I met him 
and then we took them to another level. You know, that took years and years. The first five, six years, no one believed in him. Right. You know, they were like, oh, he looks like Snoop Dogg. Uh, he's a rolling 60 Crip. That's big U. It's never going to work. And what happened, years and years and years later, it worked. So I've been involved with artists that had hits, but no one knew who they were. You know, one of our artists, Ayaz, he had a song called Replay. Shorty's like a melody. And solo. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. he had a bunch of records that were big, but it wasn't branded properly. So when he walks down the street, no one knows who he is. You understand? Yeah, yeah. So you got big records, but the branding and marketing ain't right, unfortunately. That could be wrong, but that was the record company's fault. So at the end of the day, I just feel like hard work and having an end game and setting goals and a structure of your business or what you're really doing this for when it comes to hip hop and the music business, then you'll be around for a while. No, for sure. And speaking of goals, I know you have a lot of projects going yeah. on. You want to talk about some of your goals for the end of 2019, some things you're trying to accomplish? Right. Well, one of my biggest goals is, and you know, Nipsey Hussle named me Maniac Lil Bell. <laughs> Because um, he said I was a real maniac, but you know, before he passed away, I was with him at an NCAA basketball game for Texas Tech. Okay. Shout out to Brandon One, Brand One Francis, and Bob Francis had us there. But you know, he told me, Maniac, you're a genius for my We Work in University. And what I'm proud of is that I'm changing the narrative of the music business. See, I'm not in the music industry, I'm in the music business. This is a business. So if I'm sitting down with you and you're saying you're a producer and you don't know about splits, or publishing, or neighboring rights, or royalties, you're really not a producer. You're just making beats. This is a business. We're here to make money and feed our families and help people. It's a business. So we work in university, has over 70 modules with people like Gary V talking about entrepreneurship, to Charlemagne the God talking about mental health, to Groovy Lou, a legendary stylist, to Be Real, a legendary artist from Cypress Hill. And the list goes on from every asset from a and &R publisher, a tour manager, manager, booking agent. So we work in university is going to change the game. And a lot of my peers in the industry feel like I'm a genius for that. So you go into the modules on weworkinuniversity.com and you learn about the music business from all things. You might want to be a stylist. You're going to learn from Groovy Lou. You might be a choreographer and you wonder how important it is for live performances. You might want to be an entertainment lawyer. We got some of the best. You might want to be an a and You might want to be a manager, not knowing that a manager is a uh, a babysitter, a psychiatrist, a therapist, a loan shark. So you learn a lot from different people. There's always 70 modules, and, and you sign up, and you're going to learn a lot. Right. That's very interesting, and especially because the music industry, as you know, has been, and the business has been changing dramatically over the last you know, 10 years or so. And in terms of A&R, I feel like that's interesting because that title is kind of changing in terms of the way you find artists and all that. What, to you in this day and age, is an A&R, what does that represent? Well, you know what an A&R means is artist repertoire. You know, and obviously A&Rs back in the days would go out and sign talent, right? And you might find it off a cassette, you might find it off a mixtape, you might find that as a talent search. You know, and then you develop the artist and that's what artist development was going on. Let's fast forward 20 years and an A&R really is sitting back looking at people's followings, people's uh, views, people's SoundCloud, people streaming and looking for numbers and more say off hype, not as a real artist. Right. You know, real artist is work ethic, swag, personality, charisma, talent, rights, produced, everything. But that's what changed. The internet is a gift and a curse. I mean, I love it, but a lot of people don't know how to adapt to it from the past. And that's why I call myself a dinosaur, but I'm fossil fuel. Because I stay relevant. Right. But that's what an A&R does these days. You know, we have to take it back to artist development. And artists got to really believe in their gut like I've done and not just go off someone's numbers because those numbers could come and go. But, you know, you have to be able to change with the game. If that's the way the game is, you respect it or you don't like it. You know what I mean? Right. And, and speaking of um, finding artists, because like you said, numbers and following has just dramatically changed when people are looking, especially labels to sign someone. What do you look what do you look for when you're what's your process like when you're finding a new artist? Well, you know, these days I'm trying not to manage an artist. Mm. I like to more consult, um, educate and give back. But I'm working with Sue Surf out of Newark, New Jersey, and that's probably the 
first artist that I've been dealing with for a few years because I've imagined the great Scott Storch. So I brought Scott Storch back on his comeback. You know, he had $100 million, he got on cocaine, he lost everything, and the whole industry just pushed him to the side. I've been working with him about three and a half years, and I kept my ear to the streets, and I was bringing the young artists to him to work with him. The A Boogies, the Don Q's, the P&B Rocks, the Roddy Riches, so on and so forth. So what it made me see is like, you know what? I want to start working with an artist again because I got so caught up with Scott, which was a full-time job, that I didn't have time to look for a new artist. And organically, I ran into Sue Surf through a dear friend of mine, Greg Keller. So I worked with Sue Surf, and when I sat down and met with him, it was about a story. You know, a real brand is about a story behind it. And his story was great. And people know him, but now he needs to go to the next level. He's a battle rapper, but the stigma of battle rappers is they can't make songs. So I went to Newark, New Jersey to his hood and I listened to his songs. He makes songs. Um, he's an online gambler. He roller skates. He's a Rolling 60 Crip from Newark, New Jersey. He's been in jail. He's been in the streets. He's a father. He's a son. His story's crazy, man. So, and he's a worker. So it all just fell in. I like to find things organically. I don't like to be pushed on it, um, disrespected to work with someone, you know, forced. I just like it all to be organic. And everybody I've worked with has been organic. And I go with my gut when people tell me it's not going to work, it, it winds up working. Like, I go left when everybody's going right. They go right, I go left. You know what I'm saying? For sure. You're not afraid to take chances. No, not at all. Yeah, and, and especially, like you said, when a lot of the industry was pushing Scott to the side when he was going through his troubles, like, how did, how did that come about, you two working together and um, helping him with his Yeah, comeback? you know, I, I feel like I've been ahead of my time. Yeah. Uh, podcasts are huge right now, but I had a thing called Live with Steve Lobel years ago. You can go online and Google that. Um, I saw I was, Soldier Boy. Yeah, yeah, I did J. Cole, right. Soldier Boy, yeah. everybody. And no one, everybody told me, who cares about a podcast? Now they're huge, but mm. I don't even do it no more. But I was ahead of my time. I was on reality TV. I, I don't know, I'm just a visionary. And people don't believe in it till after the fact. But I had live with Steve Lobel. And we we're talking about, you know, innovation and creativity and being ahead of our times. I'm about to launch a streaming service. Uh, it's OTT. And it's like a direct TV. And you're going to be able to watch like over 300 channels right from your phone. And Cardi B's involved with it. And I just wanted to say thank you to my partner Mongo and Albert and Jazz Prince who are involved. And this is going to be huge because you can go on your phone and watch live television from your local stations to ESPN, to MTV, to HBO, to Stars, and we're gonna create our own channels, a cannabis channel, a music channel, because there's no BET in Rap Cities, and 106 in Parks, and MTV's no more. So that's gonna be launching very, very soon, depending on when this uh, interview comes out. But how Scott Storch happened was, I, um, I was doing live with Steve Lobel, and uh, my friend Raul from Terror Squad, I saw was at his house on Instagram. So I hit him up, I said, I need to interview Scott. So he's like, okay, come tomorrow to this address. And he sends me to this address and I come with my crew and Scott's sitting in the house. I bought my chameleon air plaque because I wanted Scott to sign it. Mm -hmm. So I interviewed him for live with Steve Lobel. And when I was done, he's like, got Dr. Dre's number? I said, no, but I did have it. And then he said, you want to manage me? And I said, could you give me 24 hours? So I called his old manager out of integrity and he told me, which I love, Derek, he said, you're going to go swim with the Sharks and hung up on me. But two years later, I saw him and he went like this, salute, Steve, man, you did a great job. So I told Scott the next day I'll manage him. And um, I'm a protocol type of guy. I like to go to A&Rs and managers and executives because as a manager, that's what you want with you when you're managing your clients. And everybody I went to, I would say 90%, they told me no. They were like, Steve, come on. You know, last time he was in the studio, he wasted our time, he was on cocaine, he fell off. And Monty Lippman, Monty Lippman from Universal Republic, I called him up. I said, I want Scott to work with Nicki Minaj. And he said, always a name, always a threat. Talent never leaves. And I said, wow. And then I spoke with WAC 100 and the game. I brought game there and we did a record called All Eyes with Jeremiah. That was the first record on my Scott Storch comeback. Um... And then just started getting in with people. Once everybody was telling me no, it made me fight harder. So I would just go to the artist direct. And I, I keep people around me who are younger than me and smarter than me. You know, a successful person is always surrounded by people smarter than themselves. And I was just in the streets as well. I'm, I'm, I'm outside at all times. 
and I'm inside the corporate offices. That's what makes me unique as a Caucasian. And I would just find out who was going to be hot and was coming up. I would bring them to Scott's. Scott didn't know the mentality of, what do you mean we're going to work with them and get paid after? He used to always get paid up front. People waiting in line for him at the hit factory years ago. So I said, things have changed. The business have changed. And we, that's where we, A Boogies, the P&B Rocks, the Don Q's, the Roddy Riches, and so on and so forth came. And then later on, I gave him Dr. J's number, and they reunited. And um, now he's fixed a lot of his relationships that he burnt because of drugs. Drugs is fucked up, man. For everybody watching this, stay away from cocaine and all this shit, man. This, is, this will kill you. This will destroy your life, your career, your family, your friends, so on and so forth. You know, um, you know, I never did cocaine. I never drank. I never do drugs. But, you know, who am I? Only God could judge. But I just saw it ruin a lot of people's lives. And, you know, then I just reconnected with a lot of people. Just recently had him working with J. Cole. Just had him with 50 Cent. And it's all just me going through my Rolodex because it's not what you know, it's who you know. My relationships are great because I have good karma because I don't burn relationships. So just call people and make the shit happen. I love it. So you've been really consistent with the work. And what's cool is you, you saw those no's that you were getting. And you used that, like a true hustle will use that as fuel and motivation to yeah. just like, I'm going to prove these guys wrong. Well, you, and, you, know, yeah. well, you know what it is? Um, there's some gems that I try to tell people if they want to listen or not, but it, it, it got me to where I got to be, right? Um, and I was supposed to be, I'm uneducated, GED. I'm self-made, self-taught. Um, come out of Queens, New York, Queens finest. Never forget where you come from. A lot of people make money, get a little fame, and they forget where they come from. But, you know, a lot of my success has come from being organized, having a structure and an end game, and following your goals and, and get those things done. Um, communication. You gotta be able to communicate. I gotta be able to talk to a booking agent about my artist booking a show or a radio station playing a record or a lawyer going over contracts. So communication is very much important. Um, never taking no for an answer. You know, when I got all those no's, fuck you. I'm gonna make it happen regardless. Common sense, which is not common. And then the biggest thing that I feel is following up. If me and you didn't follow up, I wouldn't be sitting here today on a lovely Sunday doing an interview with you. Right. Following up is everything because we meet so many people every day. And I make notes. You know, my memory, I'll be forgetting stuff. I make notes, text myself things to follow up. You have to follow up, and, and, and then it, that's how business is taken care of. And you build relationships like that organically. No, for sure. And what is, in, in terms of, you know, building some of these relationships, because that's important because I see, like, you know, you're really out there. You, you're at the right places. You're always networking. And that's an important aspect. But what's some things if let's I know there's some people watching this that would want to one day be a manager, manage artists. Like what's some advice you would give them in today's day and age of some like maybe advice? I mean, to be honest with you, go with your gut. Yeah. Believe in your client. Uh, make sure there's some business with your clients and paperwork because a lot of artists get amnesia after you help them out um, because everything starts at the bottom. Um, you know, and just. You know, take some of those gems I gave you and learn and go into we work in university and learn from some of the best managers how to manage somebody because management is not easy. It's a full-time job. You're taking care of your client. You're being the asshole, the scumbag. You're fighting for your client. That's what right. a manager does, really fights for his, for his client. And, you know, when you say I'm, I'm, at, I'm outside, I'm outside, but I'm at the right places. Yeah. Less is more. Quality. Quality over quantity, yeah. right? And if I don't know somebody... I'm going to know who they are. When I go into a place, I'm not going to look for girls. I'm not looking to drink. I'm not looking for none of that. I'm going in and see how it could help me and benefit my clients. So how I met you, I'm going into a place. I'm going to find out who's the promoter, who's this, who's the young guy, who's this. I need to get to know them. I need to build a relationship with them and see what we could do. And if it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be. But the biggest thing is access. Everybody wants the access, and everybody can't get in the access. Like, you know... Just this week, I'm at T. Grizzly's album release party. I'm at, you know, C.C. Sabathia's celebrity basketball game. I'm here, I'm there. But it's deeper than just the events. Those are cool. But it's also, I'm having meetings. I'm taking care of business. And I'm taking care of business at those places, too. There's networking involved with business. A lot of people don't understand that. It ain't just play and party and hanging out. Especially for me, it's networking and building and, and making sure this one changes number and that one. I went to Hot 97 Summer Jam. I got to make sure everybody know that I want to do business with didn't change their number. A lot of dudes be changing their numbers. So I had to make sure that. 
So I'm there networking. I'm not there worrying about being on stage or being in the crowd. I'm worrying about backstage navigating and making shit happen. Perfect example, I put Quavo on FaceTime with Scott Storch. Now Migos and Scott's going to work. Like, that's what I do. Like, I'm going to put you in the corner and make that happen. Like, because you never know if the opportunity will be there tomorrow. You get it? So that's the biggest thing is the access that everybody wants. And I sacrificed a lot to get those relationships, to have that access. You get what I'm saying? So everybody can't have that access. You see me on Instagram, I take pictures of people. Nine out of ten times, I know those people. Or Johnny Nunez or Arnold Turner shooting out for Wire Image and I'm snatching a picture from that. Or I'm bringing a content shooter because I know how key content is. I've been telling people years, content is king. For years and years and years. Khaled will tell you, I've been walking around with a camera, disposable Polaroid for years. You know why? It instilled in me because I was putting up posters. I was getting clothes from companies. I needed to put on my artist. I needed to take pictures and send it back to them. You understand? So I knew how important that was. So all my throwbacks, having them, I've been blessed to have all those throwbacks because of that. No, for sure. And I do appreciate you following up because I remember when we met and you were not, we got on the phone the next day. So I could tell, you know, you're a man of your yeah, word. Yeah, you have to be a man of your word. Um, you know, and, and, and I invited you somewhere. Yeah. We built a relationship. It's about giving back. It's about letting the people who want access into the right things, who are going to take advantage of it in a good way and not disrespect it and fuck it up. And, and make you look bad. You understand? So it's all about um, integrity. No, and sure. I'm a leader. I'm not a follower. I don't follow bandwagons. I don't jump on bandwagons. And to the younger artists and managers out there, like, if you're artists, just make sure they're being themselves. That's what a real brand is. A brand has a story. It stays consistent with its music, its logo, its menu, um, its look. And a lot of times, artists, they want to follow a trend. And it's not really who they are because they think that's what's in and they're going to cloud chase and they're going to do things that are fake and try to look this and that. I explain to people a lot, you know, when they're having a million followers and they're putting up sexy pictures and they have all these likes. But then when you go put up something with you in the studio and you get nothing, then you really see why people are following you because they, they're looking at you because you're a pretty girl. You understand? And when I just saw something the other day when someone had five million followers, they went to go sell some shirts and they couldn't even sell... 10% of that. So a lot of times, don't go by off the followers. I don't. I go off with true talent and so on and so forth. Yeah, more substance. Yeah, substance is everything. Yeah. Tupac is substance. Nipsey Hussle is substance. I'm substance. You know what I'm saying? We have something in us to give back. Substance. We're not here today, gone tomorrow. We're building something. And that's why I love music that has substance like Alicia Keys and Bruno Mars and Frank Sinatra. That's me, you know? No, for sure. And speaking of Nipsey, just so we can give the people like maybe a little quick story is there anything about nipsey that just like when you think of him a story that sticks out that's just special about him that shows his character you know i'm gonna be consistent as a real real true guy and i'm repetitive in a lot of my interviews because i don't switch up and no one could catch me like oh this guy said something else i worked with a lot of artists mm -hmm. and with all due respect to all of them i love them all and help them all but nipsey was the smartest mm -hmm. um and why i say that is because he always wanted to learn. He never cared about the fame. He just cared about the fortune to make that money and put it back into his neighborhood and help his people. Um, he was always reading. He was always seeking knowledge, education, going to um, Barnes and Nobles on tour and buying books and stuff. So he was just always himself. The only thing that changed about Nipsey Hussle was the size of his clothes. Anybody knows him, he used to wear the 3X and now yeah. he's fitted. You know, and um, I got to see him you know, in that casket, and he looked beautiful. He looked amazing. And, you know, I was able to, you know, feel something special about that, that he looked so good, and God's taken him to a better place where he, he must be needed, you know? Um, but, you know, you know, I have so many memories with him. But sure. you know, I'll never forget one memory. Kevin Lyles called. He was working at Def Jam at the time, and um, they were doing a Def Jam video game, and he wanted Nipsey in it. It was way before Nipsey's popular and big. And he made a Crenshaw Gucci-looking sweatshirt, like the Gucci logo. And I only fly Delta. And he was like, he called me Maniac Lobel. He's like, Maniac, we're going to New York, but we're going to take Virgin. And you're going to sit in the middle seat. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> I hate the middle seats. I love Delta. But I said, no problem. You know, because I knew we were on a mission. And it was always me and him in the beginning. Um, and then um, we had a hotel in Chinatown. And we shared a room together. Like, we thugged it out. We just we dug it out. 
and he would go get his tea and stuff and Red Bull and we just went to the video shoot and got it done and just, you know, sharing a room and laughing, crack, cracking jokes and stuff like that. You know, Nipsey used to come to my house in L.A. from where he used to live and play basketball in the backyard, just get away and think. You know what I mean? So we've been through a lot. You know, a lot of people don't even know he had sneaker deals way before the Puma deal. He had a deal with Adidas, he had a deal with Puma. You know, we were working on a Timberland sneaker before he passed away. Um, shout out to Kyle Leonard from the Toronto Raptors, who's killing it. Yeah. You know, Nipsey did a Foot Locker commercial right around Christmas last year uh, for Foot Locker and Jordan with Kyle, Kyle Leonard. And I was, I put that together with Reg from Jordan that Kyle's always saying, in the meeting, in the meeting, we're still in the meeting. That's yeah. Reggie from Jordan. So there's so many memories, you know, just, right. you know, being on tour with Nipsey on the LAX tour with Game and Kendrick Lamar was K-Dot, a hype man for J-Rock. And me, Big U, and all of Nipsey's homies were in a Winnebago. And Nipsey was feeding me noodles and crackers and stuff. He's like, this from the, this is how you eat in the county jail. I'm like, damn, bro, but I've been on tour with Bone Thugs, and I've been on tour with Sean Kingston on private jets, eating five-star stuff. But you got to thug it out with, uh, with your artist, man, right. in the beginning stages when there's, when there's McDonald's or Holiday Inn Express, and you have to grow with them to get the bigger and better things. No, for sure. You got to put that time in. It's America, yeah, of course. like yeah. you said. And what are some, you know, there's a, I feel like a lot of, a lot of people now are trying to be artists, right? They're trying to be rappers and whatnot. And from what you showed it, like there's, it's obviously a long journey to get to that spot. What are some things they can learn from the Nipsies and these great artists that what it takes to get to that like level, you know? I feel that everybody's a rapper these days. Yes. I go to any corner in, in a mile radius right here, everybody's a city rap. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's a photographer. Everybody's a model. Everybody's a producer. Everybody's everything now because of the internet. But, um, you know, you should learn from a Nipsey Hustle to, 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 to really be a real artist. Even Russ, that guy Russ was amazing as yeah. well. You know, the way he did that was amazing. I knew his manager for a while, but my nephew Ryan connected us to Russ to work with Scott. And uh, again, you know, you have to learn from certain people. That's why a mentor is important. You don't like this one, you go like that one. You don't like that one, you go like that one. You don't like that one, you like that one. There's so many different things now to follow suit and try to be like and work hard to be like. So to all those artists out there, just be yourselves. Um, be a leader, not a follower. Don't follow trends. Um, find a dope producer and create a sound like Swiss and DMX did or Snoop and Dre or Missy and Timbaland or Mustard and YG and build a sound instead of chasing a sound. Try to be different, think out the box. Build a sound. That is a that's a great gem right yeah. there. That's important. Yeah. And like you, so you got a record out now. Let's say I'm an artist. I got a record out because I was watching something that was really interesting. You said when you were promoting one of the Bun Bone Thugs records, you kept calling video. You know, and oh, requested. Wow, yeah. Did you your know, homework? Yeah, of course. I got to do my homework. You know. Um. So I love that tactic because that's like that's a strategy, right? And. I was like thinking, if this was today's day and it, today, right? And I just released the track. Like, what's a what's a maybe a little cool strategy that I could use today to like bump that? Well, track to be out? honest with you, back then, maybe your parents know this, but there was a uh, a show called The Box. Yeah. That you control it was based out of Florida. We just had a marketing plan, and we just kept calling and requesting Thuggish Ruggish Bone. Right. And you know, we broke the record that way. Shout yeah. out to Eric Klein and Justin Tom Prager, who's now Vivo. I but, love that story. Yeah, it's yeah. an amazing story. And, yeah. You know, you know, Fat Joe, I used to get in a van with him, and rest in peace to Big Pun, and we'd get in a van, and Fat Joe wouldn't fly at the time, and we would drive to Florida, Detroit, Chicago, um, St. Louis, Cleveland, and we would go to the DJs and knock the doors open with vinyl and make them play the record right then and there. Like, you got to play this record. Right. You got to flow, Joe. You got to flow, Joe. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. It ain't just coming to you. These days, everybody just emails a record, MP3 the record, just send a link, and it's that quick. Even with collaborations. When we did Riding Dirty with Crazy Bone and Chameleon Air and won a Grammy for it with Playing Skills, shout out to Playing Skills. I just got a big Latin venture with them in publishing we'll talk about. But, you know, it wasn't, oh, you know, we're going to send an MP3 and do a collab. We did Bone and Biggie, Notorious Thugs. We were in the sessions with Bone and Biggie. Right. You understand? Yeah. So... These days, you know, I just feel like an artist needs to work their city, their block, their state. You know what I'm saying? You from New York, don't move to Cali trying to break as an artist. Work the DJs in New York. Work the clubs in New York. 
give your records out, build relationships, go here, there, there, there. And just, if the, it's all about the music at the end of the day. If Bone Thugs video sucked and the song sucked, it wouldn't have broke. So it starts, re as much as aggressive the manager is or the label is, the artist's music got to be good. It starts with the music, you know? So, For sure. you know, break in your city. A lot of people try to break other places. And sometimes you do because of Spotify and Apple and Tidal and streaming services. But to be respected really in the game, break in your own city, your own neighborhood, your own block. People in your own community got to love you first. Yeah, and I feel like that's important, like you said, like actually going out there because everything's behind the screen now, but it's still just as important to go and talk to these DJs. A lot, a lot of people, people think they, they can just do it on their couch, couch in front of the laptop. laptop. That's, that's important, important too, too, but you, but you still have, have to go out and touch the video. Exactly. Videos. People got to buy into you right. and, and love you and love the music at the end of the day. But, you know, look, you got a guy there 6 9 you know, like suck my dick, disrespectful, all that stuff, which I don't respect. You know, like, oh, I don't check in nowhere. Like, checking in, just so you know, I want this to be clear, because you have a lot of young viewers. Checking in is, when I'm going to Chicago with Fat Joe, we want to check in. We want to ch check in with Pito. We might need some guns. We might need some weed. They might need some girls. We want to know where to go get the sneak, how the sneakers. We want to know where the Spanish food is. We want to run through the projects and just show love. That's checking in. You know what I mean? So, at the end of the day, I was able to get to meet Danny, 6ix9ine. Nice little kid. You know, Scott made some big records with him. You know, I spoke to him not too long ago, and I said, yo, freedom's priceless, huh? He goes, yeah, OG, you're right. So I didn't respect what he was doing, but when I met him, I was like, he's a little kid. So he was living a different lifestyle than he really was. And that's what the young generation needs to understand. Don't portray something you're not, because that could crumble and backfire on you. You understand? For sure. Everybody's a gang member these days. Like, I, I, lived in LA, I live in LA over 20 years. I know what gang banging is. You know, from some OGs teaching me and showing me and seeing it. You understand? Getting tattoos on your face, and if it doesn't work, then how do you go get a regular job? You understand? You can't go get a job with tattoos all over your face if your career doesn't make it. So the young generation needs OGs and mentors to teach these people. You understand? And if you're going to be racist and stereotype people and judge people, you're not going to make it in the world. I do a lot of motivational speaking at schools, colleges, high schools, drug rehabilitation centers, juvenile halls, and I tell everybody there, if you're going to be racist and stereotype people and judge people, I know how you grew up or was in jail like that or the streets like that, but if you're going to travel the world and be in real society, you can't be racist. You can't stereotype, and it exists. But guess what? In the music industry, you're dealing with Jews, Italians, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, blacks, Asians. It's all types of things. It's a jumbo pot. And if you're an artist that's blessed to travel the world and go to different countries, you got to know how to deal with people from different countries, speak the language, eat their food, so on and so forth and so forth. If you really want to be a global superstar, For sure. you can't be, you know, that's how, you know, people can't be racist and stereotype people. And that's what made me who I am. I love my mother for that. She let everybody in my house, Latino, Asian, Afro-American. I grew up with all types of people, so that helped me. Right, and that's, that's one of the one great things about New York, York, too. Like, you just, as yeah. soon as you walk out your house, you're seeing someone, you know, different. Exactly. You know? So it's a special, it's a special city, city because of that. Like, that's how I grew up, too. Like, you know, exactly. Asian Especially friends, black friends, Jewish friends, yeah. like the whole thing. Yeah. So, and that, that's important that we, we're, we're blessed to have that. A lot of New Yorkers think everywhere is like that. You know, it's not. Yeah, people, you know, I've been living in Cali for a long time. People say, you're crazy. What drug are you on? Because the energy that New Yorkers have are a little different. Right. And we're very intimidating. We're very straightforward. We have no patience. So on and so forth. So if you're not, if you're a New Yorker and you live somewhere else, people look at you crazy. Yeah, that's, that's definitely, definitely true. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's fast, fast in New York. Yeah, you know, I have no patience in L.A. <laughs> yeah, and they're like, they'll calm down, relax. I'm like, no, I'm from New York. Yeah. yeah. What's, what's the, the what's, what's the, the what, what do you, you like, like New York or living in New York or L.A. more? Like what? Is, what's I the mean, difference? you know, I love New York. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm from New York. I never forget where I come from. Um, but I feel like with New York, especially with rappers, everybody's competing against themselves. Who's popping more bottles? Who got more chains, who got the nicer car, who got the nicer fur in the winter, who got the baddest bitch, so on and so forth. And there's a lot of hate in New York. Everybody's hating and not helping each other. You know what I mean? And that's what New York needs to understand. They need to stop. They need to help each other because I've watched Atlanta, I've watched Miami, Chicago, LA help each other. And that's how they flourish. Um, but I love New York. I mean, I still live in Queens. Um, I never forget where I come from, like I said. I come back all the time for meetings, for business, to see my father because his family's first. I lost my mom and I had a lot of regrets. I live in L.A. because I love the weather. I, I built family out there. Um, I built a business out there. 
and I have a lot of great relationships there as well. Um, I wish there was clones of me. People think there's a clone of me because I'm always everywhere, but I wish I tried to do bi-coastal. I go back and forth. I used to stay, travel around the world with artists for years and years and years. Took a lot of toll out of me, of and I had to have some balance and have some selfish stuff to me. I was always selfish to me. Now I need to worry about me. Yeah. You understand? I was always worried about everybody around me and all my artists. But when my mom passed, it made me realize that's got to be about me. So I dedicate a lot of time now for myself. I do cardio. I hike. Go to the beach. Go to sports games. And I enjoy life. I don't want to die tomorrow. And all I'm known for is working because I do work. Someone DM me the other day, like, you ever sit down and go to sleep on your couch and relax? I'm like, hell yeah. I love laying on my couch and watching television. Yeah. So I do find time for that. Um, I just show a lot of things, but I'm also doing a lot of other things that I don't show, like business and relaxing and stuff sometimes because you got to have your mental right. Um, but um, I love New York. I come back a lot. Uh, got some artists out of Hollis, Queens, uh, the Rich Fly G's I'm helping, Sue Surf, like I told you, and um, I love Cali too, so I just go back and forth. Um, I don't, I, 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 I've been here so many months now this year, I feel like moving back here. But I, I can go back and forth. So for sure, that's New York is just amazing, especially when it's not winter time. Yeah, <laughs> nah, it's, it's good you have that luxury because LA, that weather is beautiful. Yeah, there, I love the know? weather out there. That's yeah. what made me stay out there and stay looking young, supposedly, you know, <laughs> and drinking a lot of water. But um, it's a different thing out there, you know. Yeah. I got into the cannabis game out there okay. um, with my guy Burner. Um, he's one of the biggest uh, cannabis guys in the game. Um, yeah, he has, you know, Cookies, the brand. We were able to open up Cookies Melrose and Cookies Maywood. Um, and then he has his own cookies licensed, flowered everywhere, and clothing and stuff. And we're going to eventually come to New York. Um, so I got in the cannabis game, even though I smoke weed. And I'm working on something really, really big in the cannabis game um, that I can't talk about right now. Okay. But it has to do with music. Yeah. And it's going to change the game. For sure. And then I'm helping out my guy, Fly Guy Buddy. From Queens, I grew up with. He has a strain called Buddy Strain Gang. Nice. So I'm helping him out. Now, that's, yeah, that's what's, what's up, man. I definitely, I definitely agree, agree with what you said, said in terms of the hate in New York, because I see it all the time, where, and I was talking to an artist about it, like, yesterday, a couple of days ago, where it was like, yo, he went to Atlanta, right, the artist, and he's from New York, and he was just surprised, because he was like, yo, they introduced me to the program director over here, like, they were just giving up the plugs, and like, in New York, he's like, it's, it's different, everybody it's, keeping yeah, it to yeah. themselves, unless you run into someone like me, and I'm going to give you access if it's going to benefit me. Right. See, that's what I learned the hallway. You give everybody benefit, access, and then they don't, it doesn't benefit you. Right. So it's got to benefit me too. It's got, it can't be just one sided. It's got to be two way street. One hand wash the face, two hand, you know, one hand wash the face, two hands wash the face. Yeah. And it's got to be reciprocated. For sure. But, you know, I, I, I shouldn't even say, you know, there's no hate at other places because Nipsey died from hate. Yeah, of course. Man, so, you know, in his own community from someone he knew. So there's hate everywhere. But you know what I'm saying when it comes to New York, it just feels like it's just more like cockiness or just holding it for myself. And like I said, I go to the clubs and I'm like, well, who's popping more bottles? Who got the bigger chains? Who got the this, that? And I think it just, that's why New York sacrificed and suffered a long time. And now because of A Boogies and, you know, so on and so forth, things are happening. You know, I love what Young M.A. was doing, but that stopped and Troy Ave was doing. Those things stopped. It was bringing New York back. Right. I want to see New York come back because New York is where hip-hop started. You know, Fat Joe's always keeping it relevant every year, coming back with a hit for New York. And watching the young boy A Boogie is amazing and stuff. And, uh, you know, just have a lot of great artists coming out of New York right now, so it's a good time. No, for sure. It's just that the DJs at the radio stations and the clubs need to support, support New York. Yeah. Not, they could support Atlanta and L.A. and so on and so on, but support home team first. And I blame that a lot on the radio stations and DJs. There's a lot of great DJs that do support, and there's a lot that don't. Yeah, that's true. There needs to be some more spins for these New York artists. Yeah, or just even in the club, just love. Yeah. But it starts with New York, giving love back. Who cares if you're in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan? It's all the same. It's New York. Yeah. Um, I, I, when I was doing a little homework on you, I wanted to, since you're so behind the scenes and you know so much stuff that's going on and, and the, on the business side of things, who's someone else behind the scenes that makes a lot of things happen that maybe doesn't get a lot of credit or people don't know about that really makes things happen? You know? That's a great question. Um, you know, I've always been behind the scenes. I always was playing the back. I don't want to take pictures. I'm thinking it's the feds. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm just wanted to, yeah. you know, inspire and motivate right. and push my artists. And that's why I left working at a record label. Because I want to go fight for the artists against the record label because a lot of times the record label say they care about the artists, but they really don't. You yeah. understand? Yeah. And they put artists in fucked up deals. But, 
you know, I don't, I don't do stuff for credit, um, even though credit is part of your resume and, and, and value. I would like my credit, and I ask for my credit, but I'm not going to force for my credit from an artist. But things that I do, I'm going to make sure I get my credit for. But now, because of social media, I'm outside a little bit more, and people say, hey, we working, yo, we working. But do you really even know my history? Right. Well, you just see me on Instagram right now, we working. But we come from no Instagram. We come from rows of quarters and pay phones and beepers and so on and so forth. But there's a lot of people behind the scenes that I guarantee you, if you saw them walking down the block, you wouldn't know they are, and they could change your life. Right, right. They could change your life. Yeah. You're running into the clubs worrying about getting close to the artists that are not going to change your life nine out of ten times. But it's the guy walking down the block that you don't know and you didn't do your homework of that could change your life. Yeah. You understand? No, for sure. You know, Ghazi and Empire. Change your life. Nima, Amir, you know, bl blame the label. You know, there's those guys, you know, they're up at um, Empire. Right. You understand? But Empire's doing a lot of great things for, you know, artists, right? Mm -hmm. And stuff for the community. You know, I feel like Rob Markman is a guy behind the scenes, but he's also a rapper doing things. Elliot Wilson, journalist. For sure. Um, you know, there's so many people, like E-Man, Program Director of Power 106, Ebro, Hot 97. You know, there's a lot of guys behind the scenes that, you know, when I see them, like you know, like Shampoo, mm -hmm. you know, who does all the guerrilla marketing for a lot of labels and Def Jam, like Shampoo deserves his roses while he's alive. This guy's done so much for the culture. You know, D and Shadow, they do radio promo for labels. They need their roses. Brian Sampson. You understand? Yeah. There's so many people behind the scenes, lawyers like Gary Greenberg. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, A&Rs like Mike Karen. So many people behind the scenes that, you know, really helped move this music business and culture. For sure, because I was, I was, you just mentioned a lot of names. Some of them I did know, like, you know, shouts. Obviously, I... I probably and I could sit here and the you platform. know, so, yeah, so but, names. You know, know, like Elliot Wilson, I, I, what he does for <laughs> yeah. the culture is yeah. incredible, you know? And I ask that to, because since we're in such an Instagram age now, people see this big artist and they're like, oh, the, but they don't see the huge team of people that yeah. are pushing this artist. You well, know? you know what a team means? Together, everybody achieves more. Right. No one could do themselves. Like, you got Tony Neal. You need to know who Tony Neal is. You know, you know, he's huge when it comes to all the DJ and the coalition. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I could sit here and just tell you different people that need to be saluted, um, you know, that work behind the scenes. Nino Cuccinelli from Interscope, who's been responsible for breaking artists at Interscope for so long. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't know him walking down the street. Right. You know what I mean? Guys like that. You know, I can go, you know, through my list of so many connects of people that are behind the scenes making things happen. You understand? Yeah, for like, sure. Like, you know, that been around for a long, like Julie Greenwald. Julie Greenwald runs Atlantic. She used to be a Def Jam. Um, Faith Newman. You understand what I mean? So many people behind the scenes, like, you know, Rob over at Mass Appeal, who's a journalist, Dayton Thomas, you know, Vanessa Satin at Double XL. These are people behind things. You know, Greg, Grouchy Greg at allhiphop.com. You know what I mean? Trent over Hip Hop DX. These are people behind the scenes that are helping and pushing stuff. You know, we created a thing called Tracklet. Um, it's an online sample service. You know, back in the days, if you sampled a record, mm -hmm. it would take you six months to clear it. You don't even know if you're going to be able to clear it. Um, the, the legal fees, the, the fee to sample costs so much money. So we created a thing called Tracklet. Eric Sermon's involved, Zay Tobin's involved. Um, Prince Paul's involved, and basically you can go online for a small fee and you could sample tons and tons of music out of this site. J. Cole's record, Middle Child, was sampled off Tracklip. Khaled's new record um, with Buju Banton, the intro to his album, was sampled from Tracklip. So we created something different for producers because there's a lot of producers out here who say they're producers. They don't want to sample because they just know Fruity Loops and all that stuff in the computer, but they should know that they can sample and some of the biggest records in the past are sampled. Khaled's new album, a lot of his albums, you sample. There's nothing wrong with that. A lot of people in their mind think they don't need to do that. And if you're a producer, you need to know about neighboring rights. You need to know about publishing and splits when you make a record and who gets what, what writer gets what, what producer, the artist, so on and so forth, and your royalties, and how do you get paid as a producer? Right. And that's why you need a team. 
going back to the team, yeah. you're seeing all the success. Success comes with a team. That's why I say together everybody achieves more. For sure. And that, you know, once you have a established team, you got the person that is getting your press. You got the person getting your shows, you know, yeah. the day to day. The, the you know, there's publicists behind the scenes like Echo Haddix. Okay. She's a legend. And Moses, you know, they do so much for their artists, but they're behind the scenes. Right. You know what I mean? There's a lot of people out here that really work hard behind the scenes. And if you're not behind the scenes guy like myself, you don't know who they are. And artists need people from behind the scenes to help them with their careers. No, without a doubt. That's, that's, that's key, man. And um, I wa wanted to ask you this, because you work with so many great people in the industry. I wanted to ask you two questions, like two in one type of thing. So what is a characteristic you see those people that are super successful, something they all kind of have in common? And also, is there any person that you haven't worked with yet that you were, you're really trying to work with or make something happen with? Um, you know, those people that I salute is because they're focused, mm -hmm. they're determined, they sacrifice, um, they look at the bigger picture, they don't look at the candy, they look at the candy factory, you know, they, they look at longevity and building a legacy of what they do. All this is great, but it's people behind the scenes that I look up to that are really behind the scenes making stuff happen and what they all have in common is the love, and the drive, and the passion of what they do. What keeps me going is the love and drive and the passion of what I do. Someone that I never worked with that I would like to work with, it's a great question. Um, I've touched past with a lot of people. Um, and again, unfortunately, a lot of percentage of the music business, a lot of people are fake. Um, they don't keep their word. They say they're going to do one thing and they don't do their word. So I, I really, uh, at this moment, no. Gotcha. I look up to, I work with, like I said, Tupac. I, I, I manage this group, The Outlaws, rest in peace to Qatafi and Fatal Hussein. Um, I work with, you know, like I said, Tony Draper, one of the best CEOs, executives in the game. Um, Easy, I worked with rest in, rest in Peace, Biggie, you know. I work with a lot of people. Uh, um, I would say maybe um, I'm working with Rock Nation because Scott's, you know, recording a lot of music with the locks and other people at Rock Nation. You know, Jay Z's, I look up to. He's a great businessman. For sure. Um, I've worked with him in the past, man, back in the days with MOP, and I still see Hove, and he was working with Nipsey. Yeah. I don't know. I've worked with a lot of people, man. Yeah. Um, even Scooter Braun, I look up to Scooter, and I worked with him in the past, you know, being on tour with him for a year with Sean Kingston and I as with Justin Bieber. So, I don't know. Um, I let God deal with that, you know. Yeah, for sure. If it's meant to happen, it will. Yeah, I always touch, I'm always touch bases or touched a little bit or sprinkled a little bit with a lot of people in the industry. Right. Probably the next generation of new guys that I don't know yet, yeah. I want to work with. Got you. I'm writing a book. I'm writing a book called The Coach Lasts Longer Than a Player. Okay. Um, which I'm going to try to do a documentary as well with something like that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I learned the last few years, and I should have learned this a long, long time ago, but most artists that I worked with wrote their own music, right? Right. And I never managed a producer. So when I started managing Scott, I really started learning about publishing and how important songwriters are to sessions. Because a lot of your favorite artists out here don't write their hooks or their songs. Right. And it's, it's noted. People know that. So I really got involved with the publishing world a lot. And um, I created We Work in Publishing. You know, I have a few different things. Like We Work in Agency, uh, where that's where Fly Guy Buddy comes in. And my guy Joe, who's a dope young manager in the music business. Um, I have We Work in Music, where it goes through STEM. We're about to drop a new Bone Thugs and Harmony single with all five called Survival. Yeah. Um, so I go through STEM, which is a distribution channel. Um, so I have we work in music, I have we work in publishing, we'd work in agency, we work in university. But the we work in publishing is going through a company called CTM. Okay. And anybody listening should learn about CTM. They used to be called in Mockham. They're the world's largest independent publisher in the world. From Mark Ronson to Phil Collins to the Steve Miller Band to uh, so on and so forth, right? And since I learned so much about publishing, when I run up to people every day and I see people, like I said, I'm out. I'll ask them the first thing is, you got a pub deal? 
And you'd be surprised a lot of them don't, or they just got out of it. So publishing is what you call real mailbox money. It's IP, intellectual property, that is longevity money, and it keeps giving. So I created We Work in Publishing. We're about to make a huge announcement. And Play and Skills, because they're signed to a different publisher as Play and Skills. But I always like to empower people and give them their own opportunity. So I came up with this idea. I'm very creative, I think, out the box. And we gave them a deal for them to be their first publishing company. Now, they're signed to a publishing company as producers, but now they're their own bosses. Now they're executives. Now they can go sign writers and producers. So we gave them an opportunity, which no one would have gave in the publishing world, but we did at CTM. Because they're the biggest producer in the Latin world right now. They got that record, Kakama, with Daddy Yankee. And they're big artists in the Latin world. So they transitioned from urban to Latin. So now they're young bosses, young executives. And you hear about it in the next few weeks that they're going to sign young writers and producers out of Mexico, Colombia, Miami. Because there's so many young producers writing, for Jay, um, writing and producing for Jay Balvin, Bad Bunny, Azuna. And those guys will find them. And now they could go sign a check to somebody. So instead of being a slave to another publisher, now they're bosses to their own publisher. So we just did that and then also did some other deals. So I'm about to go aggressive now and sign a lot of people to we work in publishing. Gotcha. So that's what I'm working on as well. That's huge. I'm excited for that announcement yeah. and some of those artists. Um, what, are, what are some other... Um, can you tell, tell me just a little bit about the, the book, The Coach? Yeah, you know, the book is... Uh, it's called The Coach Lasts Longer Than a Player. I've been working on it for years. People are like, when's it coming? But I don't know if it's going to be about my whole life story and the music business or just the music business. Because I'm not a snitch, but I want to just call out so many guys and people in the industry that are so fake and phony. You know, a lot of all the people who passed on Nipsey Hussle and all these other things I went through. But I, I'm not a bitter guy, just a real guy. But I'm just going to probably make it about the music business. Um, and there's a documentary that everybody should watch, including yourself, called His Way by Jerry Weintraub. There's only one person I wanted Jerry to meet. Jerry Weintraub? Jerry Weintraub. Yeah, I've, I've seen that. He yeah, it's produced a, the Ocean's Eleven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so he has a doc called His Way. Yeah. He, he started off as a mailroom of William Morris, wound up managing Frank Sinatra and Elvis, Elvis Presley. Presley. yeah. And I watched that doc over and over. Me too. And I've told people to watch it, and they just blew me off. I've told people to watch it, and they watched it. And that could tell if someone's focused or not. Superman, seen that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. amazing. Chef Gordon, so, yeah. My brother-in-law told me about um, his way. Yeah. So there's no person after that I wanted to meet in my life is Jerry Weintraub. Yeah. I was at the Playboy Mansion for a party, rest in peace to Hugh Hefner, and Jerry Weintraub I missed by 10 minutes. He yeah. came to that party, but he wound up passing away months later, but I could have at least met him. That was someone I really wanted to meet. You know, what's, forward you know what's crazy, Steve? Like, I'm not lying to you. Of all the people in the entertainment game, I wanted to meet him the most yeah. as well. Just because after I saw that documentary, I was like, wow. Like, yeah, I'm going to mimic uh, his doc off yeah. a doc of me. Right. And the book. Right. And, you know, um, my partner, we work at university, you know, told me about Gary Vee, which I knew Gary Vee. And right. Gary Vee sat down with us when we work at university, but he wants to make me the Gary Vee of the music business. So he's yeah. going to start living with me and making short clips and... You know, we're going to start doing that shit for social media because yeah. I have so much knowledge and experiences from being in the game for 30 years and I'm still doing it and still relevant. So I'm going to do that. Yeah. And you're still hungry. You're still learning. I'm you know? starving. Yeah. Yeah. I'm starving. Yeah. I love it. You know, I'm you, starving, man. You came starving. here on a Sunday on time. It, yeah. it, you know, it, you know, just, I, it means a lot, man. I'm starving, man. And you know yeah. what? You know, when you say on time, I try to teach everybody I work with. And these are gems for artists coming up that you should be 15 minutes early. You shouldn't go and smell like weed and alcohol. You shouldn't bring a whole bunch of people with you to the meeting. If you're going to real meetings, you understand? Yeah. Like people say to me, yo, why don't you take me to the J. Cole session with Scott or the 50? I don't need a picture also. Like, we're going to a studio session to work. I'm not even in the session. That's like going to Citibank to work or being a school teacher. You're going to work by yourself. Yeah. So a session is for you to go work. Yeah, I went there, we got a picture, yeah. I went to a meeting with 50 Cent. I'm his manager, Scott, so we went and had a meeting. People need to understand that. So when you go to meetings, you show up 15 minutes early. You don't smell like weed. You don't bring the homies. You don't smell like alcohol. You don't be fucking leaned up. And you go in there prepared like a professional, like you're going to get a real job or you're going to get a bag or you're going to go try to close a deal like a professional. 
and bring the people smarter than you around you, like a lawyer or a manager, to speak with you. Real artists don't speak for themselves sometimes. They let their manager or their lawyer negotiate. They talk creative. They talk vision. But then they let everybody do their business. You understand? So those are some gems. And you go there and you don't act ignorant. You go there and you talk business. That's how business is done. So when you say I'm on time, I'm on time. Because that's what real business people do. Once I give someone my word, and my, all I have is my word and my balls, I got to come. I never cancel. I don't miss flights. I don't miss meetings. I don't do nothing. Never. Unless I'm dying and really sick, do I cancel. Right. And those are gems that people need to understand. Educate yourself. Ask questions. Read. Google. Learn. Don't be ashamed to learn. If you look up to Nipsey, Nipsey was learning, asking, educating, reading. And he was still a hoodster. You understand? So you need to understand that. If you're looking up to certain people, look up to them for those reasons of their mind. Their integrity, their morals, their principles, their loyalty, their growth. You know, there's a lot of people that don't grow. Right. A lot of people. I, I got to get them away from me. Yeah. I love them, but they don't grow. You got to grow in life. If you don't grow and you're going to keep doing the same thing and be stubborn and I don't want to be around you. You know, you got to be able to grow. That's what's important. You have to learn from your mistakes, learn from your experiences. Take that, do, boom. Take advantage of situations in a good way. That's what I always do. Leverage everything. I leverage everything. You understand? For sure. And don't be scared to ask and, and, and get, seek knowledge. Yeah, because that's one important thing, especially seeking knowledge, right? When a lot of people starting off in the music industry, they, they get these internships, but they're just getting coffee and they're not asking questions, you know? Listen, so. I'm, I, tell, I tell my nephew, you're working at a record label as an intern. Take the CEO out for lunch. Say, hey, uh, you like to go for lunch? He's gonna look at you like, what? Or go through the principles of protocol. Go to his assistant. I would like to take him out. And if you don't go that way, that assistant's a hater. And just go to him, catch him in the elevator, the bathroom, and say, I'd like to take you out to lunch. I guarantee you, a lot of interns don't do that. You take the CEO out and take him to lunch. Cost you $30, $20, slice of pizza maybe. And just ask questions. And he's gonna say to you, He's going to always remember my back of my mind. Like, wow, he wanted to learn. You understand? Of course. If you have a relationship with an A&R or a label, but you work somewhere else, but you look up to that person, shoot him a text. I'd like to take you to dinner. And gain knowledge from ask questions and stuff. Right. No, that is that is a real gem right there. This is what I tell people. Yeah, like, yeah. yo, you're trying to get in the cannabis game. Go ask questions. Learn about that. That's it's why I that. had to get that on Play camera. Play stupid. Yeah, yeah. Play stupid. Yeah. You're trying to get into merchandise business. Go sit down with merch people. Take meetings. Educate yourself. Learn from them. You might not do business with them, but they might think you're going to do business with them. But educate yourself from people who've been successful, who's been doing it and done it, but organically build it. Don't do it disrespectful or force it. You know, people be like, yo, I need a meeting with you. What? How you say that to me? Oh, I'm a summer jam. Yo, check my music. I put the phone to my ear. Like, hold on. I'm from Queens, man. I'm a street dude. You ain't gonna just disrespect me. Yeah. I'm not here for that right now. Right. Like people are out here disrespectful. That's why I love 50's clip the other day when he was on a date or with abroad yeah. and he was walking and some dude check out my IG and check. Yo, it showed you 50, no security. He's still where he's from, Queens. Yeah. Like, hold on, you're gonna disrespect me. And I feel like that sometimes. People be like, yo, check my music or put the phone up at Summer Jam twice, two people. Like, yo, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. It's a time and place for everything. Of course. So if you're gonna seek knowledge and seek education, do it at the right times, the right place. Like, don't be scared to ask. Like, lower your pride and your ego sometimes. And let me go take this one to lunch, this one to dinner and learn. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's the problem. A lot of people are scared to do that. Yeah. Ego. Ego's, ego's a motherfucker. But watch your ego because everything goes up, must come down. And everybody's not hot all the time. You're going to be warm. You're going to be cold. You know what I'm saying? And For cockiness, sure. leave that shit behind the door. My career, I've been blessed, cruise control. So I appreciate you sitting down with us. Um, is there any, is there anything you want to drop? Let them, let the people know where they can find you on Instagram yeah, and I socials. Mean, you know, yeah. again, like I say, Instagram and social media is a gift and a curse, but yeah. I have to be on it. Of course. So it's we working on Instagram. We working. It's uh, Twitter at Steve Lobel. Mm -hmm. uh, Facebook is Steve Lobel and A to Z Entertainment. You can Google me. It's gonna be tons of stuff coming up from my lawsuit with Louis Vuitton and Kanye West party to me being on Millionaire Matchmaker reality show to me being on the road to start of Missy Elliott, Mona Scott, 10 years ago on that, to working with Bone Thugs or Run DMC and so on and so forth. So you can Google my name. I'm outside. 
I'm approachable as long as you respect me. Um, I'm available. Um, you can email me. It's on my Instagram. As long as everything's organic and we build a relationship organically and it's respectful, I'm cool. Because yeah. you never know who's going to be the next, 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 next. And I want to be part of that next, next, next. As long as we're not going to sell our souls, our integrity, our loyalty, and get amnesia. Sure. A lot of people get amnesia as soon as they get a little famous or money. And that's the worst thing. You understand? Of course. And people deserve their credit. People deserve to shine. People deserve to get paid for their hard work. People deserve to do a lot of things that they work hard for. You understand? It ain't just one-sided. It's a two-sided street. Wow. No, I, that's, that's real. And, um, you know, it's really humbling the fact that you came by and done all this on a Sunday. Yeah, it means a lot, you know? You know what it is? You know, organically met a relationship. I had a gut inside of me about you. And everybody should remain humble at all times. Yeah. I'm a humble motherfucker. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was up in Harlem yesterday and we're driving a car. And people were running up on me like, yo, get a picture. I'm like, what the hell? Like, I, I, I'm like, what's going on here? My guy says, like, yo, Steve, you're outside. People know who you are if they're into the culture. Yeah. I'll get out the car and take a picture of people if that's what they want. Right. I'd rather give you education, though. Yeah. But the biggest gem I want to give everybody outside, I mean, listening, and I learned the hallway, is balance. We don't have balance. And when you're in this music business, you're grinding, you're working, you're chasing, and you're just hustling. And sometimes... You don't have the balance for your family and your life. And I learned the hard way when I lost my mom because I didn't have no balance. And now I have balance, which is the hardest thing. I'm not married, no children, because I have no balance. No normal girl's going to stay with you. I don't want to be a baby daddy. I want to be there for my child. So teach yourself balance. It's the hardest thing in the music business and in life. How do we balance the priorities, the rights from the wrongs? Like right now, when I leave you, I'm going to have some balance. I'm going to go relax. Right. I'm going to go swim. I'm going to go sit in a jacuzzi. I'm going to meditate. You understand? Yeah. Then I'm going to be back working. Yeah. But balance is the hardest thing. And don't cheat yourself out of life because you're just grinding and working so hard that you lose the, the, the finer things in life. And the finer things in life are your family, your blood, and your real friends that really care about you when you don't got shit. So balance is the key. And I, I'm 53 years old, going to be 54. I'm just finally teaching myself balance which is the hardest thing to learn yeah that's that's especially in new york and i understand it's everywhere like it's you know everywhere if you're grinding it's just it's yeah. hard to find that time to just yeah. enjoy the moment you know yeah. so that's a great piece of advice and then the last question we like to ask our new yorkers when you think of new york what are some things that come to mind for you something when, that's special when i think of new york what i think of new york is uh the new york knicks the New York Giants, New York Islanders, uh, and the Mets. I'm a sports guy. I think of uh, Lemon Ice King and Corona. I think of uh, Amaro's Pizza in Whitestone. I think of 388 Restaurant in Roslyn. I think of uh, the E and the F train. I think 125th Street in Harlem, Apollo Theater. I think uh, swag and fashion. The hottest clothes, uh, sweatsuits, tracksuits, honestly champion, polo. Um, I think of my father, OG Ted. I think of uh, Jam Master J, rest in peace. Um, I think of just grape papaya and red onions. I think of Wohop, duck sauce, can't find duck sauce in LA. Getting me hungry. Um, <laughs> You know, Dunkin' Donuts, some nice Boston cream. Yeah. A Mr. Softy chocolate shake is really what I think of, too. Right. And a good-ass bagel. Right. Man, everything bagel with some cream cheese and lox. Ah. So that's what I think about New York. Good food. Um, four seasons of weather. I like the snow sometimes. Right. Um, realness. Culture. Fashion. Food. My father. So on and so forth, man. For sure. It was a pleasure, Steve. I appreciate it. Pleasure's mine.